I'll get the microphone down. Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand together before we get into this and uh, one more time, praise the Lord and lift our hands and thank God for Jesus tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for Jesus. That Jesus died on the cross for us, shed his blood for us, that we could have salvation, healing, deliverance, miracles, prosperity, all the blessings of heaven belong to us tonight. Father, those that have come with great need, Lord, we thank you that that need will be met. Lord, we thank you that as we release our faith, that we make contact with your mighty power and it drives out the problems that the enemy has brought. Every name that is named must bow its knee tonight to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for miracles. We thank you, Father, in advance for showing yourself strong in this place here tonight. Lord, that there will be testimonies in this service of your healing and miracle power in Jesus name we give you all the glory honor and praise hallelujah amen praise the Lord you may be seated God bless you how many of you have come tonight and you would say uh, brother David I have a tremendous need I I need a miracle I need a healing in my life I need a divine touch of God raise your hand Amen. Well, you'll not be disappointed because, not because I'm here, but because Jesus is here by the Holy Spirit. His, uh, as Pastor said earlier, His presence is here with us. You don't have to wait till the end of the service, uh, you know, where prayer is offered or whatever, to begin to receive. Hallelujah. We tell people all the time, uh, when we, especially when we preach in uh, other countries, uh, you know, like uh, the third world or whatever. It's, that's incorrect. I understand it's uh, 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 not politically correct to call them the third world. They're developing nations, but some of them I'm wondering what they're developing into. I, I, I see it going the other direction in some places. But um, the developing nations will go, uh, you know, South America, Africa, wherever. And uh, I'll tell people that Jesus is here and he's moving amongst you to touch you and to, to heal you and to deliver you. And all you have to do is let your faith go to God. And when your faith goes to God, his miracle power comes to you. It's the touch of faith that makes a difference. Now right there as I'm speaking, the Lord has just changed my whole direction tonight. And I had, uh, as uh, one minister put it, I had... Uh, something wonderful prepared, but when the Lord removed that wonder <laughs> uh, and uh, replaced it with a different one. So if you would please turn in your Bibles to uh, the, the book of Mark. I'm sure a familiar passage of scripture, but something that I want to emphasize that I just felt the direction of the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you would look please at Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. We're going to look again, probably for most of you it will be a, re a review, uh, at the woman with the issue of blood. There's some things the Lord has been showing me as I've been preaching this. And let me say as you're finding scripture, that uh, again, we're, Sheree and I are honored to be here with you. Been looking forward to these meetings, Pastor. It's good to get to know you and uh, a new friend. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and then we're also happy to be here with Adrian and Irene Weening, who are um, the Canadian representatives for Kenneth Hagen Ministries uh, office. Do I have that right? Uh, appropriate title. And uh, we don't want a memo getting sent back faxed somewhere. He said it wrong. Uh, praise the Lord. And uh, also uh, for uh, Jerry Savelle Ministries, I think they're representatives here uh, in some way. And uh, so we're happy to be with them. They were with us in Smith Falls as well. And then uh, the Marshalls, praise God. Good to be with them again. And uh, mainly to be with all of you, praise God. We met Pastor Jay this morning. He was here. So uh, what, a, what a 
uh, uh, blessing and a privilege to meet all the Canadian ministers. Well, they're not all the Canadian ministers, but uh, <laughs> all the ones I know, anyway. I've been held hostage in Toronto for many years, so praise God it's good to get out and, and meet others. Uh, Mark 5, 25. Hallelujah. Uh, let's look here at this. If you weren't here this morning, I urge you, I, is, are, the, are the audio and uh, all that, oh, so, so uh, you can get a recording from the morning uh, session, and I urge you to get that, because it's, it's on this book, Empowerment, Why Every Believer Can Do the Works of Christ. And we're going to go into that again tomorrow morning, amen? amen? How many were here with us this morning? Did you get anything out of it? Yes. Praise the Lord, we're going to hit it again, go deeper right. into it, and... Uh, and, and uh, Maybe be inspired to do something with ourselves <laughs> and touch somebody else's life. Uh, let's begin reading here. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had but was nothing better but rather grew worse. Now, has anybody ever known anybody like that? Bless her heart, she's not only still sick, now she's broke. Sick and broke. It's bad enough to be sick without being broke, or to be broke without being sick, but when you're sick and broke, that can be a very discouraging situation. Here she is sick. She spent all of her money. Now the interesting thing about this is, she took a great risk. It was illegal with her particular condition. It was illegal for her to be out in the public in that particular culture. And so uh, she went ahead and broke the cultural rules anyway and uh, went out, you know, amongst people to find Jesus. The interesting thing about that is that she figured, I, you know, I looked at that for many years, she figured she didn't have anything to lose. That's true. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do to her? Kill her? <laughs> you know, I mean, she's already dying. She has nothing to lose. I've told people before throughout the years that's needed a miracle, that's needed a healing. I've, you know, one, like one lady went up to, we have an evangelist in the United States named R.W. Shambach, and, uh, you know, tent preacher, the eternal tent preacher. And, uh, and, and, and somebody came up to him, a lady, and said, Brother Shambach, I'm down to zero. He said, Praise the Lord. She said, why would you say such a thing? He said, well, now you don't have anything to lose. You might as well just believe God 100%. What have you got to lose? You're dying anyway. You know, that's, that, that sounds like a negative, but it's not. It's really true. It's like folks that have, you know, that, that's at, people say, well, I'm at the end of my rope. Well, just tie a knot in it and hang on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? I, you know, with faith and with confession, oftentimes folks will they'll say, well, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything the Bible says to do. I've prayed. I've read the scriptures. I've jumped for joy. I've run. I've done everything, you know, that, that, that one could do. And uh, I'm still sick. I'm still not any better off. And I've told them, well, just be a fanatic. Become obsessed with the fact that by Jesus stripes you were healed. What have you got to lose? You're dying anyway. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, why hold back? Well, they say, well, they might think I'm a nut. Well, just tell them the thing's gone to your head. <laughs> well, it's in my brain now, I suppose. I don't know. This is what I feel like saying. Humor me. I'm at the end of my rope. Amen? But you don't have anything to lose. You've got everything to gain. So, you know, sometimes, what do they say? Desperate times call for desperate measures. Uh, again, the definition of insanity is just sitting in the same place, doing nothing. The lepers at the gate outside the city. Why sit we here until we die? That's a great message, by the way. I wish I could say it was mine, but it's not. It's Oral Roberts. But <laughs> praise the Lord. He preached a great one on that. Why sit we here until we die? Just And, and, and I heard Brother Roberts uh, preach that. <clears throat> they had a, you know, a, a video recording of it from the, uh, <clears throat> from the tent. 
back in the 50s. He preached that in the early 60s. Why sit we here till we die? Just waiting. And he said most Christians, that's what they're doing in many cases. Just sitting, just waiting, waiting for something to happen, singing Kumbaya, come by here, Lord. You know, here I am. Someone singing, Lord, come by here. Here, please touch me. You know, and, 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 and they've been saying, say, how long have you been saying that prayer? How long have you been waiting? Well, you know, 14 years. Well, I'll be glad when the Lord sees fit to do it. Well, I'll be glad when the Lord sees fit too. I wish fit would show up. Where is Where in the world is fit? Fit needs to come. Mr. Fit needs to come in so the Lord can see fit and do something. <laughs> That won't translate, by the way, when you go to a foreign country, but it's great for English. Why, why? Well, when the Lord sees fit, I'll be glad when the Lord sees fit. Well, I will be too. Then you can just quit having an excuse. Amen. But I just wanted you to see this woman here. She, what she got to lose? She might as well throw caution to the wind. I've been there. I don't know if you've been there or not. I've been there in life before. I just decided to be a nut. Just go ahead and be, in other words, just be obsessed with saying what the word says. What have I got to lose? Going down the tubes anyway. That's right. How many know what I mean by that? Sure. Praise the Lord. So that's where she's at. And uh, I'm glad she got up and did something. Yeah. Hallelujah. Some folks will use that as a test of the Lord's will because they can't read the Bible. They'll say, well, you know, whatever happens, we're just waiting to see what the will of the Lord's going to be. Whatever happens, that we'll accept that as the will of the Lord. Well, that's ridiculous. That's really just doing nothing. I like the story of the lepers at the gate again. They just said, well, why sit we here till we die? We're di well, they're dying of leprosy anyway. What have they got to lose? Let's go into the city and see. Maybe there's food left over. Maybe there's something. And they went in and found blessing. Amen? Right. Hallelujah. Well, you know, you just might ought to change your direction. If what you've been doing hasn't worked, why stay with it? That's right. Well, this is what I've always done, Brother Horton. Well, that's why you've always got what you've got. How about change it? Well, moving right along here, we'll get the service off the ground any moment. <laughs> They're working on the wings now. Verse 27, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. <clears throat> the press is always in the way. <clears throat> For she said... <clears throat> <laughs> if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Now you're going to see here in just a minute, we've, we've had a great problem arise in the modern church of really almost a superstition when it comes to the anointing of God, the power of God. The power of God is tapped through our individual faith through believing and reaching out. But you know, a lot of people focus on the garment. Well, it was the garment. But Jesus didn't say at the end of this story, my garment has made you whole. And the Bible here speaks about the virtue or power of God. Jesus turning, right. it says that power left him. Nowhere does it, he didn't say, my power has made you whole. It got quiet on that one. He said, your faith has made you whole. Now, uh, we've thank God for the anointing. Thank God for understanding the power of God. You know, we act like there's nine Holy Spirits. There's only one. One Holy Spirit, he manifests himself in different ways. One person said that, friend of mine did a big study on the gifts of the Spirit. He said, really all Paul is saying there is these are the nine regular ways in which the Holy Spirit constantly manifests himself, as opposed to nine specific, you know, kinds of things. And those are just, in other words, and there can be combinations of those. And those are just the nine regular ways. There's other things God can do. Don't have to be, you know, we don't need to use Scripture to limit God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyway, this, uh, uh, this emphasis that we've had in recent days, recent years, on the personal anointing of the minister, 
Thank God that we need anointed ministers. Thank God we need folks with the power of God on them. But we've gotten it turned around where we've put more emphasis on the personal anointing of a minister than we do the Word and the Holy Spirit in many cases. Probably not here in Canada, but down where we're from. And I remember Kenneth Hagin, we talk a lot about him. He had an impact on all of our lives, me personally, as well as in a ministerial way. But I remember Brother Hagin, now, I used to, when I worked for him, it was sort of the heyday of the ministry, you could say. He was doing eight day crusades in many places. Sometimes. Uh, you always, always two services a day. In some places, we had three services a day. And then he'd fly to the next place, and we'd all scramble with vehicles and trucks and vans and equipment and get everything moved and start the next place. So, you, you know, you, you get to, you memorize some of his statements after a while because he said it every service. Almost every night service, Really, in a certain period of time, almost every night service, Kenneth Hagin would uh, have a healing line, lay hands on the sick to try to get everybody in, several night meeting. And he would always say, he would tell the story of his personal anointing. He would tell the story of how uh, Jesus, you know, he was in Rockwall, Texas, 1950. That's a suburb of Dallas now. It was just sort of an independent town then. 1950 in Rockwall, Texas, he's in a, tent, in a tent meeting. And he's praying on the platform. And he says, I asked him one time, what were you praying? He says, oh, I was just praying regular stuff. Lord, bless the meeting. Lord, bless the people. You know, nothing deep. I said, well, why were you praying on the platform? He said, because the tent was muddy. <laughs> I didn't want to mess up my shoes. <laughs> So he's praying up on the platform, and he, and, and, uh, and he hears the words, come up hither, come up to the throne of God. Well, he thought, now to show you how much, you know, he, I said, were you expecting anything or asking God to appear to you or anything? He said, no, you don't have any Bible grounds to ask God to appear to you. Amen. That would be flaky. Right. Amen. See, that would be granola Christians. Yeah. Nuts, fruits, and flakes. Get into some of that stuff. Asking God to do things that are outside the scripture gets you in trouble. So anyway, he's, uh, he's, he, said, he said, to show you what I thought, I turned to the pastor and I said, send some of the men to the top of the hill. I think we've got hecklers. He thought some young folks had gotten up on the top of the hill making fun of the meeting and, and acting like that they're the voice of God speaking. That would have been a funny thing to do, you know, if he was rowdy. You know, even church kids will do stuff like that. Now, my dad was a pastor my, uh, and a minister, you know, my whole life. And, you know, he's just in church all the time in the 60s. We were Pentecostal group, you know, we was just having a revival meeting after another one. And I remember one night in the church, my dad was, you know, uh, overseeing. He was actually the state overseer, but we had a local church in the city we lived in. And, and so my, we had a baptistry up in the back, you know, with the glass and the picture of Jesus behind it and all that. And... Uh, it was made out of sheet metal. So when it didn't have water in it, the bottom of it would go, wah, 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 you know, if you walked on it. So my, me and the pastor's son decided one night that we were going to give the congregation a thrill. <laughs> on a Sunday night, on a Sunday night, you know, I was about eight years old, on a Sunday night, they always got the music cranked up pretty good out of the Pentecostal church. And, and they'd say, you know, the power of God is here. They would always say that every Sunday night. The power of God, the Holy Ghost is falling. And I said, now when they say that, let's jump up and down on this thing and make a big noise. And they'll think something's happening. A sign and a wonder. Sounded like thunder, you know. 
So we hid. We got there early and hid down in the baptistry. They started the music, and we were whispering, you know, and trying to stay quiet. And then we waited for one of the preachers to say, And the power of God is here. The Holy Ghost is falling. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, it just rang out in the church. Well, some of our little ladies, you know, little Pentecostal ladies, they thought for sure they were having a, a rapture or something, a rapture or a rupture. We didn't know quite what. But they got out in the aisles and started hooping and hollering and running and screaming and... And, uh, but my dad and the pastor knew what was going on. I think it was three days before I could sit down normally. We didn't do that again. That didn't go over, but it was fun while it lasted. So anyway, Brother Hagin thought maybe some of that going on. You know, he sent men up to the top of the hill to say, well, who's mocking the meeting? Who's saying, come up hither, come up to the throne of God? Well, he said, you know, they sent some men up there and they came back and said, no, Brother Hagin, there's nothing's going on. There's nobody out there. And so he didn't say anything. He just kept praying. He heard it again audible voice come up hither come up to the throne of God and he said when he looked around again this time he's standing where the top of the tent should be and he's thinking well how did I get up here and uh, and he's and now he wasn't physically standing there but the Lord had spiritually taken him, taken him to that place. Remember what Paul said over there? You know, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. You know, to you it's just, it just seems normal. But if you're having a spiritual experience, what am I on this for? It'll help somebody. Amen. Well, we're just here having a camp meeting, aren't we? Praise God. Yeah. Let's just have something happen. Amen. Instead of having, well, he preached nine, 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 you know, he, pre he preached for 90 minutes and then we left. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that something? <laughs> I mean, if we're just going to have church, I've been in church enough to laugh. I could not go to church if, if God was counting services. You know, people, well, have you, do you go to church on Sunday? And uh, we do. But, you know, if he's counting services, I'd already have my quota for my whole life <laughs> filled. I wouldn't have to go ever again, and I'd, be, I'd, be, uh, I'd still be at the top of the list. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he said, <laughs> he's up there, and Jesus began to share with him the whole vision. He said to tell it, it lasts about an hour, hour and a half. But it, anyway, during the time, he said, I've called thee and anointed thee, and given thee a special anointing. You know, to pray for the sick. And then he put the finger of his right hand in the palms of both of his hands when he said that and all that. And then Brother Hagin would say this, and you tell the people that I told you to tell them <laughs> that if they'll believe that and mix faith with it, that they'll receive their healing. And then he said this. This is the part that's been forgotten in, our, in, in, in so many places. He said... Uh, now, tell the people this. This is the lowest level in which a person can receive a healing. Isn't that interesting? In the United States, we've seen so many preachers and groups and folks raise that special anointing and that special touch as if it's the highest expression of faith. As if it's the highest level. Oh, I want to get in so-and-so's meeting. That's the highest level to receive a healing. But no, Brother Hagin said it's the lowest. <laughs> That's the reason that when Jesus met up with the centurion and he says, I'll come to your house to heal him. And the centurion said, no need to come. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, it's the greatest faith I've ever seen. I just thought I'd throw that out just to shake you up a bit because our, our Christian media has sort of pushed us over towards, you know, clamoring for, you know, the, the guy with the special sauce. <laughs> now, we could all talk about our special sauce. But we're sort of putting the emphasis on the wrong thing. If anybody could have talked about special sauce, it would have been Jesus. 
who was anointed without measure. And yet, with this case here that we're trying to preach, he said, your faith has made you whole. He didn't say, my anointing. And I've heard preachers in recent times, all they want to talk about is their anointing is what brought the blessing. And that's not balanced. Something's off with that. Hallelujah. Say, well, you're, I don't know if I like that, Brother Horton, because I'm, I'm, I'm all excited about all that. <laughs> well, you ought, to, you ought to get this because the thing that is, is liberating for me is that because every man has been dealt the measure of faith, you have something with you all the time that will work and bring the power of God to your life 24-7. You don't have to wait for the big preacher with the big mailing list to fly in. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Regain my composure. <laughs> um, now, verse 30 says, Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue or power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, and said, who, or the crowd, the press means the crowd, who touched my clothes? And his disciples, remember the clueless disciples from this morning, they never, okay, those disciples, said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging. When's the last time you used that word, seest? <laughs> All right. Thou seest the multitude thronging thee. <laughs> it's an interesting thing how the Holy Spirit only prophesies in Old English. Have you noticed that? <laughs> There's a great story of a, there was a conference kind of like this, and you know, full gospel church in a, you know, Pentecostal evangelist is there and he's kind of walking along the front row and he recognizes one of the ministers and he has a word from the Lord for the minister. And he says, Oh, my son, I say unto thee, Oh, 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 I forgettest thy name. <laughs> <laughs> Old English. Now, that raises many questions on many levels, doesn't it? I forget it's thy name, yet I have a word for you. God forgot his name. I love Old English. It provides great comic material to spice up the message. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thou seest. <laughs> See, you can't do that with just normal language. It affects your preaching style if you change translations. Thou seest the multitudist thronging thee and sayest thou <laughs> people say why do you cut up so much during I've cut up my whole life in church I used to get spanked for it <laughs> but I never quit <laughs> <laughs> and there's endless you know if you have any kind of sense of humor about you there's endless material in church endless <laughs> there's always church people around to provide you know material um, thou seest 
the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. Now that brings up something interesting is that people say, well, you know, the will of God is all predetermined for every person, but it didn't seem to be here because Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is part of the Godhead, he did not automatically know who had done it. Why didn't he know, huh, 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 huh? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> why, why didn't he know? If it's all so predetermined and it's all so predestined, how come he didn't know? He didn't know. Because I'll tell you why. The love of God and power of God is like the air. It's like all around us. He's poured out his spirit on the earth. Hallelujah. And anybody who taps into it can get it. It doesn't go through a committee in heaven. Meeting in committee room 101 immediately after the service. They have this website that you can look up um, sermon, I mean, I mean, a bulletin bloopers, you know, from churches. They're like literal, and, and I love some of those. They're just hysterical. Like one is that, you know, many churches have different groups that meet during the week, you know, in Sunday school rooms and places. And one is that, you know, one said something like that the, the, the low self-esteem group would be meeting, you know, uh, uh, you know, a certain time in a certain room, please use the back doors. <laughs> and, then, and then another one was that, that the Weight Watchers group would be meeting, you know, in the sanctuary, please use the double doors. <laughs> These are literal things that, see what I mean by material at church? You can't, you can't buy that. I mean, that is just classic. So, so Jesus did not know. <laughs> Jesus did not know, you know, who had touched him. It wasn't predetermined. The committee had not met. And, uh, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, because she could feel in her body. The Bible says that she could feel in her body that she was healed of that plague. It's all right to feel in your body that you've been healed. Amen. It's not all just confession and, you know, and spiritual. Right. Eventually it needs to translate into the tumor drying up right. and the eyeball popping open. like an actual healing in the healing meeting. All right. Excuse me, Pastor. Will there actually be miracles in the miracle rally this week? Well, we're trying to get some, sister. We've got a new song we're going to try out. Maybe that'll help. Um... <laughs> We're trying to get to the higher levels of praise. We're down here somewhere. All right. What level are we on? All right. <laughs> Knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. She, she knew that she had been touched. She could tell that the uh, hemorrhaging in her body had dried up and had stopped. Thank God. And, uh, and so she came and she told him, I'm the person that touched you. And, uh, and so he said unto her, daughter, my powerful anointing has made you whole. Could, he could have said that. He was powerfully anointed, but he didn't. He, he, he could have said, daughter, my saturated garment has made you whole. Saturated with the power of God right. has made you whole. But he didn't. He said, your faith 
has brought this healing to you. And so I often say, if her faith could bring healing to her, your faith can bring healing to you. Amen. Amen. She's not a special person. She's not a 25-year member of the choir. Amen. She's not a member of the Dorcas Sunday school class. Or any of those things. Her father's, you know, her family's name is not in the window of the church, you know, engraved. They gave the money for that window. She's just a woman in need and is desperate. And she reached out and got a hold of her miracle on her own initiative without even praying to God and asking him to do anything. She was just going to pull a fast one, touch God and get out. She was singing, reach out and touch the Lord and then run for it. While, and, and, and he said, you know, behold of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came a ruler of the synagogue's house. Thy daughter, you know, he picks back up where it had left off the story. And another great, uh, you know, raising of the dead story. We don't have time to get into that. But this was some, he was not even going to her. He was not preaching. He was just passing along, going to someone else's need. And on the way, she pulled a fast one and got a miracle. Amen. Amen. So it brings us to the moment of truth now. Praise the Lord. If that worked for her, right. hallelujah. Still at that point operating under the provisions of the old covenant. And we've got a better covenant established on better promises. Hallelujah. Better means better. There's not less provision. Now, again, in preaching this around the world, I've always added this part because it's so important. Again, I grew up Pentecostal, and we used to have people that would constantly sing songs, because we believed in divine healing, uh, about reaching out and touching the Lord. And uh, uh, one, one number went something like, if I could just touch the hem of his garment... You know, I knew I could, I knew I could be made whole. We used to have people stand up and testify. Oh, if I could just live in Bible days and I could just touch Jesus, what a great thing that would be. How marvelous, wouldn't that have been marvelous to just be able to touch him as if we can't touch him now. But, and then in some groups, you know, I'm sorry to say that some groups, if they could find the the cloth that Jesus wore on that day, it would be in a museum, probably in Austria. <laughs> they have the best goodies of religious memorabilia. <laughs> At the Habsburg Museum, you can go in there and see splinters from the cross and all kinds of interesting things, supposedly, as legend has it. But if someone could find this garment that she wore, that, that Jesus wore on that day and put it in a museum and folks would seek to try to touch it or, oh, what a great artifact, what a great relic. You know, maybe is there still any healing power left in that? Or people long to see a physical vision of Jesus. Oh, if he would just appear on the platform. Paul had an interesting, different take on that. You know, he finally said to, I guess there was an argument over, well, we were actually with him, and you came along later, and now you've got all these ideas. <laughs> and he kind of hijacked the Bible from them, didn't he? You know, re, he wrote more than they all said. But uh, Paul finally said, we will no longer speak of Christ after the flesh or even know or relate to him after the flesh, but only after the spirit. Amen? Wow. 
Now, we don't have, I, I don't want to shock you or anything, we don't have Jesus waiting in the wings here in the flesh. He didn't like drive in from Toronto, from the airport, you know. Uh, you know, his plane doesn't have a Holy Spirit dove on the tail. Uh, the Holy Spirit, by the way, is not a dove. He, <laughs> it's an analogy. It says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and we've turned him into a dove. <laughs> it's true. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. <laughs> He's not a dove. He descended like a dove. <laughs> Anyway, I hope that's not part of your, like, logo here or something. Like <laughs> Get in. There, wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? Wouldn't you know? If anybody's going to do that, it's me. As I was saying... Holy Spirit like a dove. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I think it's great. <laughs> they have a horse? We got all kinds of things. <laughs> Butterflies. <laughs> Take your pick. The daisies of Sharon. <laughs> anyway, it's a valid point <laughs> that we call, you know, we get all off on these things. But the point is, is that we, 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 we idolize stuff, you know, and we would have, well, the, this is the garment that Jesus wore, you understand, uh, you know, and, and the folks have been known to touch it and be instantly, well, you know, it, and, and Jesus is, you know, has flown in, he's waiting in the wing somewhere, you know, and he's physically here, he's going to lay, have a healing line. I mean, people would get all excited, but I want to tell you, you've got something better than Jesus in the flesh. He's not here in the flesh. He ascended. He physically ascended and went to heaven where he sits now at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. But what we do have is something he said, we read this morning, he said, I am going to go away. If I do not go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come. But when I go away, I will not leave you alone or lonely or comfortless. The, the, I will pray the Father and he will send the Holy Spirit who will come and not just touch you. Touch me one more time, Jesus. Just, mm, just touch me. Mm. Mm, Jesus. No. He didn't, he didn't say that the Holy Spirit would touch us. He said he would come and dwell in us and abide with us forever. The Holy Spirit is here in the hearts of every believer. He is here as we gather together and, and, and in faith and in praise and worship to the Lord and in prayer. Hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is here. And you don't have to, it doesn't even matter if you're sitting down front or in the back row, the same power of God is available to you. We've got this other nonsense concept that the closer down front you sit, the more anointing you will experience. <laughs> That's just superstition. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is wherever you are. That would be unfair for God to bless folks. You know, if, there were, if, there, if, the, if every seat in this auditorium was taken and somebody couldn't even hardly get in the door and they were sticking their head through the door to hear the word, if they released their faith, God would touch them just as fast for salvation, a healing, a miracle as somebody sitting right in the front row. We need to stop saying some of that stuff. It gives, it gives the wrong impression. But anyway, that's just my opinion. What do I know? I mean, I come to the church and preaching and I criticize the dove. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just saying that I know that no matter who you are or where you are, if you release your faith. One quick story and then I'm going to minister to you. My, my um, 
family. Uh, my, I am a fifth generation Pentecostal person. My great great grandmother wore her hair in a knot and spoke in tongues. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, so my years ago, in, in actually the year uh, this particular tent meeting was about 1958, Oral Roberts had his tent up in Jacksonville, Florida. Now my family, uh, you know, my uh, heritage, my family is all from the southern part of the state of Georgia. And so that's not very far from Jacksonville. Jacksonville is in North Florida, so it's not that far. But uh, my, my, my mother was there, my father at this tent meeting, my grandmother, and then my great-grandmother. And uh, all, you know, saints of God, all believers. And so they had gone to Brother Robert's tent meeting. Now my, gra my great-grandmother had a goiter now, you used to see a lot more of that than you do now, but for some reason, you know. Uh, anyway, she had a great goiter on her neck, and it was so bad that it, they say that it was choking her and uh, that she could not breathe uh, very well. You know, I was, uh, in 1958, I was one years old, <laughs> and so I, I got stuck off with somebody. I don't know. <laughs> you know, put the child over there and give him food. He'll be fine. Who, feed and water him. <laughs> So I didn't, I mean, I wasn't at the meeting. I, I wouldn't have any memory of it if I was. I was one, think about it. Anyway, so, <laughs> but the story goes that uh, my, 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 my mother and grandmother and great-grandmother were there. My dad was there. He was probably sitting in the preacher section somewhere. Uh, they used to put all the preachers on the platform in those days. You know, all the preachers were up on the platform. And uh, so, uh, and no, no preacher's wives, just preachers. So my mom is back there in the tent, way in the back somewhere, with, with uh, my grandmother and my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother has this goiter, like I said, that's choking her. And they said it's gone, it's, you know, as much as it's on the outside, it's on the inside. And they're going to have to do surgery, and she didn't like that. And wanted to believe God for a miracle. Nothing wrong with that. Today that would be called not using wisdom. But in those days they called it faith. But anyway, <laughs> praise God. We move along, don't we? and progress. So uh, she said that she was going to believe God and have a miracle. So that's the main reason that she came. Now she had a job in those days in a cotton mill. My great grandparents and my grandparents were cotton mill workers. And so she only had but just so many days that she could take off work, you know, because she's a, just, a, just a, you know, paid, uh, you know, wage laborer, you know, blue collar worker, they call it. And so uh, she uh, is, is uh, she's got to get back and get to her cotton mill job. And so she's got train tickets. The uh, train was more popular then, you know, and so she's going to ride the train from Jacksonville back to a city close to her get off the train and, you know, be at home. Well, now, Brother Roberts had so many, how many want to hear this story? He had so many, uh, you know, otherwise we could just meet with the three that want to, <laughs> after the service, in the committee room. Um, but uh, in those days, I mean, uh, like I said, people took the train. She's got to get back. Brother Roberts had so many people to pray for that he had to use a number system. They had healing line cards they'd pass out. And you had to go, to even get a card, you had to be five days in Bob DeWeese's um, uh, healing, afternoon healing class. Or you couldn't even get in the healing line, get out the car. Because there's just, you had to weed it out somehow. There's just too many people. So he wanted to make sure that folks knew what it meant to have hands laid on them. Folks knew what it meant to release their faith. And he didn't have time to teach on all that. So he had an associate evangelist. He did all the teaching. And so you had to go to get the card. Anyway, my grandmother, she'd gone to the class. She bought the book, If You Need Healing, Do These Things. He had to do that. And uh, she was ready. And she realized she's in the last afternoon meeting that she can be in. She can't stay the next week. 
This is like Sunday afternoon. She's got to get back by Sunday night on the train to be at work first thing Monday morning, like the four o'clock shift, you know. And so she's sitting there and she's smart enough to realize that the, at where they're calling the numbers to come and bring your card and get in the line for Brother Roberts to pray for you and lay hands on you, where, where they're calling the number, what am I doing? You're looking at my feet, praise God. My wife, hallelujah, is helping me tonight, amen. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, is there something wrong with my shoes? And so, uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> And, and so anyway, uh, you know, she's looking at the numbers and looking at the card and, and, and she cannot, you know, figure out when is, uh, you know, they're going to get to me. And she says, my train is going to be leaving before I can get in this line. I do not have time after coming for that particular reason to have her goiter removed by God. She can't do it because... Um, you know, there's no time, and she can't lose her job. What's she going to do? And so she's talking about it to my grandmother and my mother, and, she, and, and my grandmother is worried about her, and she's saying, well, I don't know what you're going to do. You know, she said, you know what? She said, Oral Roberts is not the healer. Now, this is my great-grandmother. She says, Oral Roberts is not the healer. He's just an instrument of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here in the tent and I can receive sitting back here in the section just as fast as getting in that line. I don't have to. I'm not impressed with Oral Roberts. That's what she said. She says, I don't have to have him pray for me. I'll just receive from Jesus. And she said they watched her and she stuck her hands in the air and said, I receive my healing now in Jesus' name. And then she put her hand on her throat. And when she removed her hand, the goiter was gone. Amen. That's a good heritage to have. Miracle people. We just expect miracles. Hallelujah. And she said, well, I got what I came for. I can go home now. She got her purse and headed off for a taxi to get to the train station. Praise the Lord. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about. See, she didn't have more faith in oral than she did the Word and the Holy Spirit. And it's really wrong for us to have more faith in men and their special anointings than it is the Holy Spirit. I tell people when I pray for them, hallelujah, I'm going to lay hands on you. God's healing power is going to go into you. But at that point, you let your faith go to God and you receive directly from him. His healing power will come to you and drive out what's wrong with you. Amen. Let's just stand up a second, adjust our positions. Lift our hands and praise the Lord. I hope I said something that would inspire your faith. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your presence here. Thank you, Lord, for all those that have need that they will be touched. And I thank you for the voice of God speaking to me tonight as an added bonus to our faith. Lord, just to help us to receive. 